Hello, this is Greg Allison Green Greg's coming to you on 14 March 22. Time on deck is 11.05 hours Central Daylight Time. And today I bring you special guest, Dr. Peter Vincent Fry. He is the director and founder of the EMP National the Task Force on National and Homeland Security. And we're very fortunate to have Dr. Pry on today during uh, with all the things that's going on, because among other things, he is a weapons systems analyst, an expert in that area. And many of you know, he's been a long time advocate of power grid defense. He's a real champion in that area. He's done so much for us in this uh, regard to get the word out and make people aware of what we're facing today. And today we're facing a potential nuclear threat and he's gonna put a spotlight on uh, just how either misinformed, incompetent, or, or, or perhaps even lying our national leadership is to us. So we've really got to pay attention to this. Now, friends, I bring you this as part of my eyes wide open <clears throat> and head on a swivel video series so that you can know the threat that we face and prepare for it. And maybe you can take action to help alleviate some of this stuff, maybe to wake our leadership up to the things they need to be aware of. You can always go to uh, my website, uh, uh, freedomrestorationfoundation.org with Action Center, where you can take action. Dr. Price has got his website. He can mention for that for the uh, EMP Task Force on National Homeland Security. And uh, <clears throat> by the way, guys, you need to prepare. You need to get ready. Right now, I've got a special. If you go to printwithgreg.com, you can get $150 off a three-month supply of food that's got 2,000 calories a day. It lasts 25 years. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, a deal that'll make you a winner because uh, they have not increased their prices yet like so many others. And food prices are going up dramatically. Uh, they still offer this great savings, $150 off for six of those buckets is two. Uh, you get uh, two of those per four weeks. One bucket lasts two weeks. And you can get $50 off a four-week supply still. I'm surprised they've left that bargain up. And uh, uh, my source, when you go to prepwithgreg.com, is my Patriot Supply. My Patriot Supply has the widest selection of anybody for long-term food storage. They still have supplies on like some of the competitors. So if you click on their logo, I still get credit when you go into their website and purchase. And they got other prepping supplies, such as a purification, sanitation of water and air. And oh yeah, by the way, they did have iodine, potassium iodine tablets, but I think they sold out. So keep an eye on that. You might want some if you can find them. So ladies and gentlemen, with that, I give you Dr. Peter uh, Pry. Dr. Pry, uh, <clears throat> I'm seeing some reports from uh, Senator Jim Reich, uh, Republican of, Ohio, of Idaho, and also uh, of uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, who are saying essentially that, wow, if we get into it with Russia, we'll just beat them very fast and uh, they'll cave in that this is not gonna be a World War III. I, I'm, I'm, I'm aghast that our national leadership is taking such a cavalier stand to a nation on nuclear weapons, which uh, outnumber ours. What do you think about it? Well, I think they're recklessly irresponsible. And I think they are, uh, the Republican Party has blown a, a golden opportunity to uh, draw a bright line between what our foreign policy should be, America first foreign policy that puts US national interests first versus the globalist agenda. You know, which is what the Biden administration and NATO are following, that puts US national interests last and puts the international law, the supranational in institutions like NATO and the United Nations, puts those, their interests above it. And America is put at risk and our national interests and our most fundamental national interest being survival is put at risk by recklessly challenging Russia over Ukraine uh, that could escalate into a nuclear war uh, or, uh, uh, for a, a nation that where the United States has no vital interests. Uh, and this, uh, now, one of the things that's happening and one of the reasons I, these people are probably misguided, you know, is because I think the Biden administration is uh, either lying about the level of the nuclear risk or they're so incompetent that they are not capable of recognizing it. And why do I say that? Well, a couple of Sundays ago on February 27th, you know, Vladimir Putin, the dictator of Russia, announced a, a special nuclear alert of his forces. And then he disappeared from view. He's still gone from, uh, you know, he went down into one of his deep underground command posts, of which there are hundreds of these nuclear command and control facilities in Russia. Uh, uh, there are thousands of them, actually, uh, hundreds of them that are deep underground. 
they're buried under hundreds of meters of solid granite. Uh, they're like uh, vast underground cities that can accommodate 30,000 Russian elites and they're impervious to nuclear attack. And uh, the, uh, then last week on March 8, uh, we were told by uh, America's top intelligence officer and spy, Avril Haines, who is the director of national intelligence, uh, she told Congress in an open worldwide threat briefing that they give every year to Congress. Uh, she is the head of the intelligence community and she was accompanied by other intelligence community heads, basically said uh, that Putin is bluffing, that he's nuclear saber rattling, and that they've been carefully watching Russia's strategic posture and they see no evidence that Russia has moved to an alert, has mobilized its forces to a higher state of readiness for a nuclear war. They say they, they haven't seen ballistic missile submarines put into sea. They haven't seen bombers mobilizing. They haven't seen more ICBMs moving to the field. And that these are, in effect, the indicators that they would be looking for. And so I wrote, a, uh, I've been write, written a couple of articles. I've got another article coming out called the 9-11 in our future, you know, because uh, uh, I predicted back in 2020 in a, in a, in a, in a report that I wrote called uh, Surprise Attack, uh, ICBMs and the Real Nuclear Threat, uh, that argued that if a nuclear war ever happened, it would be by surprise attack and we would be taken by surprise uh, because of the dysfunction within our intelligence community and its, uh, uh, its inability to recognize the signs. Uh, but let's start off, uh, I should add that when I worked for the CIA, one of the things I did is I, was, uh, I worked with the National Intelligence Officer for Strategic Warning. Uh, and, and the job there was to look for scenarios and indicators uh, of an elevated threat of nuclear war. And I actually got a special award, a unique award for, from the CIA. I did such a good job. But I guess I couldn't have done such a good job because obviously the leadership of the intelligence community uh, doesn't even know the basics about the threat of surprise attack from Russia or the possible or of elevated nuclear war. Now, indications and warning 101, if you were taking a course in the intelligence community, they say the first thing to look for is, is there a big conventional war going on in Europe that involves the nuclear superpowers? That's the first and most important indicator. And the answer to that is yes. You know, we've got a big conventional war in Europe, the biggest war in Europe since World War II, happening on the ground in Ukraine. And it involves both the nuclear superpowers. Well, right there, that fact creates an elevated threat of nuclear war happening. You know, this thing can get out of control the way World War I did, you know, where a single bullet into the chest of an archduke, an Austrian archduke, uh, escalated into World War I and uh, from a single bullet. And, uh, and four years later, there were 40 million casualties. Now, another big strategic warning indicator is dictator Vladimir Putin himself. He's the dictator of Russia. You know, he's the national command authority and he has the power to execute those forces, to launch those forces all in his hands. And he has declared uh, that his forces are in this special combat duty, special alert, and he has gone down into his command and control post, the cockpit for waging, uh, for, for launching a nuclear war. Uh, I don't think you actually need to know anything more than those two facts to say, wow, we face an elevated threat of a nuclear attack. But instead, our intelligence community is saying, well, Putin is bluffing and he's not serious. And this is what we call mirror imaging, you know, uh, at best, it's mirror imaging. If it's not mirror imaging, then it's a lie. And what do I mean by mirror imaging? Uh, that means uh, that you project onto your adversary your values and your worldview, in this case, about nuclear war. And in the West, we have brainwashed generations into thinking, well, nuclear weapons are not usable. Nuclear war is the end of the world. You can't fight and win a nuclear war, which is what President Biden said to Putin when they met in Geneva last summer. Uh, you can't fight and win a nuclear war. So only a crazy man would even think about using nuclear weapons. I think I, 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 I've but lost. That's not what Putin said. Putin said that uh, he could win a nuclear war. And Putin has said in the past 
that he thinks that the United States and Russia would, would actually get into a war. He's been saying that for a couple of years or more. When Putin and, and, and Biden were in Geneva, uh, Putin heavily signed on to the joint statement that a nuclear war cannot be won and must, must never be fought. But that's purely for propaganda purposes from their side, because they know that empowers and reinforces you know, the Western uh, terror of nuclear war and it empowers the anti-nuclear groups that want to stop US, the US from modernizing its arsenal and want the US to embrace self-destructive policies like no first use, which would no first use of nuclear weapons, which would undermine all US security guarantees all around the world. Uh, so, the, so Putin is glad to sign on, as are the Chinese, to these left-wing anti-nuclear sentiments. But you have to judge them by what they do. You judge them by their fruits. And uh, you know they're building deep underground facilities to survive and prosecute a nuclear war. Uh, they're building their forces for first strike capabilities so that they can uh, win a nuclear war by being faster on the draw, by striking first to disarm their opponents. And their military doctrine that explicitly talks about uh, using nuclear weapons to prevail, uh, to win a nuclear war. Uh, that's what they really think. It's just the opposite of what our own uh, elites think. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, but going beyond that, let's get into some more of the technical details. When uh, the director of national intelligence, Avril Haines, uh, who is a lawyer by training, by the way, you know, she, she never, uh, or she's not a, a deep technical expert on, on Russian military history or Russian nuclear forces Russian nuclear operations, as I am, okay? But uh, she is uh, really fundamentally under, misunderstands what Russia's strategic posture is. She was describing America's strategic posture, okay? When she was saying, well, I've looked at the Russian strategic posture and therefore I'm not worried. Uh, uh, you know, because America, uh, uh, most of our forces are not but we have, we have 1,500, approximately 1,500 nuclear weapons that are, uh, that are in our operational force. We have thousands more that are in the stockpile, but those are not operational weapons. Those are warehoused away. They're, they don't really count. The Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists and the Union of Concerned Scientists are always fond of, of, of saying, well, the US has a stockpile of 6,000 nuclear weapons or something like that. But that's not how many nuclear weapons are available for fighting a nuclear war. Those weapons uh, you know, are in various stages of disarray, and it would take months or years to bring them online, if you could bring them online at all. What we really have is uh, the 1,500 weapons that are permitted under the New START Treaty. Those are our operational weapons. Most of those are not ready to go on short notice. Really, only the ICBMs are ready to go on short notice. That's 400 weapons out of the 1,500 weapons in our arsenal. Most of our weapons are on ballistic missile submarines. And these are mostly at port, not at sea on patrol. Uh, and those submarines that are at port uh, cannot strike this Russia from port because they are armed with intermediate range missiles. So they have to go to sea in order to attack Russia. Our bomber force, which carries more weapons than our ICBM force, uh, it takes three days to generate the bomber force. So how come we have, we have postured ourselves this way? You know, the reason is because of our arms control theories and our worldview on the idea that nuclear war cannot be fought, cannot be won and must never be fought. The purpose of our weapons is to deter a nuclear war from ever happening. And the part of the way we, we do that is through transparency and, uh, and posturing our force for crisis stability. Uh, the, uh, now, I don't ha happen to agree with this philosophy, but it is what has driven our strategic posture for decades. And the idea is, is that we don't wanna have a lot of weapons that are on a hair trigger that can be fired really quickly. And we want our adversaries to know that we can't uh, attack them uh, in a surprise attack. Because if you get in a crisis with them, then that gives them more assurance so that they won't feel threatened. We want them to be able to see that our forces are not postured for attacking them. And, uh, and we want to have the flexibility so that we can signal them by mobilizing our forces, either partially or wholly, 
by starting to send submarines to sea that they will be able to see. We're starting to mobilize our bombers so that they will be able to see that. So that that's sending them a signal, you know, that they'd better back off. And uh, that's the theory behind it, that our force is a deterrence force. It's postured for nuclear diplomacy. Uh, and it, uh, and it stems from this conviction, this deep conviction in Western strategic culture that nuclear that a nuclear war cannot be fought, uh, cannot be won, and must never be fought. Which is an ironic thing to believe, since World War II was a nuclear war, uh, and we won that nuclear war decisively by the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, now, the uh, Russians have a completely different view. They have a completely different worldview. They have a completely different history. They have a long and bloody history uh, stretching back hundreds of years where they've been invaded uh, by the Mongols and by the Ottoman Turks and by the Swedish Empire under Gustavus Adolphus and by Napoleon and uh, by the Germans in two world wars, uh, you know, including Hitler. And one of the memories that's most seared upon the imagination of the Russian general staff is, is the invasion of Russia by Nazi Germany in World War II during Operation Barbarossa which was a surprise attack, uh, as many of their bloody experiences have been surprise attacks, uh, which cost them 30 million people dead in, in World War II. And it almost resulted in the extinction of the Soviet Union. They nearly lost to that surprise attack. And from their per historical perspective, given this bloody history, uh, they make decisions which are differently rational from ours. They are not crazy, okay? but they have a different strategic culture. I would call it a strategic culture of profound paranoia, that they th see threats where they don't even exist. And I contrast their strategic culture with our strategic culture, which, what I call, what, which I would call, describe as one of the dysfunctional optimism, okay? Where we, we are, you oftentimes will deny threats right in front of our eyes, which is how we get ourselves into Pearl Harbor type situations, or how we overestimate our, intelligence and our own ability to plan. So we get ourselves into situations like Afghanistan or Iran or Iraq, uh, you know, where we end up losing against uh, much lesser powers, you know, because we have overestimated our own capabilities and our own intelligence and underestimated our enemies, underestimated our enemies. Now the Russians have postured their strategic forces so they can never be surprised again. And in fact, they're determined that they're going to want to be the ones who launch a surprise attack in some future war, because that is the best way to win a nuclear war, to strike first, to strike, destroy your enemy's nuclear forces before he strikes you. So they want to be faster on the draw, beat us to the draw, and kill us. And, the, uh, it's, and that's why their forces are, are uh, mostly intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, which can be launched in minutes. Yeah, let me add to that, Peter. Uh, given uh, the development of hypersonic weapons that they have now, uh, and they do have some submarines, they could launch on the United States and, and we could be hit uh, really fast with these before the public could be warned. And their first targets would be, and this is what the people watching need to understand, those submarines in the port, the, the, the uh, strategic air, uh, the, the SAC strategic air center bases that the Air Force has, that the bombers operate out of, uh, that would be a number one target. And of course, our ICBM missile fields. Uh, if with a surprise attack, they could take the, most of our missiles out in the ground. They, uh, especially, uh, even if we saw early enough to launch those, they could definitely get our, our, our SAC strategic air bomber fields and those uh, submarines in port before we'd have time to react and get these things out. They could be taken out by surprise attack entirely. Then all we've got is our missiles that's in the ground, which would uh, be under bombardment. So we would be at a severe strategic uh, disadvantage in a situation we're in now without things deployed forward. So the, our posture leaves us wide open, in my humble opinion. What do you think about that? No, I completely agree. Uh, and I've written about this. You know, the first thing they do is probably an EMP attack. Uh, they could orchestrate an EMP attack and not just a single one over the United States, but they'd probably hit uh, all of those forces targets, the ICBM fields, you know, uh, of which there are three, uh, the, the three strategic bomber bases and two ballistic missile submarine ports, 
In the scattering, you know, there's maybe three cru crucial command and control nodes, you know, uh, that probably have one big EMP that would cover the whole country, uh, but quickly behind that uh, have uh, EMP attacks focused on, on, on those three ICBM fields, on three bomber bases, on, on the two ballistic missile submarine ports, and a few command and control nodes so they could have, so they'd hit, hit you twice, the whole country, and then the specific uh, uh, putting peak fields on each of those critical uh, nuclear forces nodes, uh, you know, to optimize the chances for knocking them all out just by EMP. And so they might be able to win a nuclear war just that way, just with the EMP attack. But Russians being conservative military planners, you know, what they'd be counting on at minimum is the paralysis of our command and control long enough so that their warheads could then reach our ICBM silos or ballistic missile submarines so that in effect be killing them twice, once with the EMP attack and then again with a kinetic attack using the nuclear weapons that would go down and, and impact on them. And I would point out that now going back to DNI Haynes's allegation that the Russian forces, that she sees no evidence of the Russian forces being on a nuclear alert, all right, which shows she does not understand the Russian command and control and nuclear forces capabilities. The submarines are also intercontinental ballistic missiles on the Russian side. Unlike our submarines, which carry intermediate range ballistic missiles, their submarines are all armed with ICBMs. So they can launch right from port and strike their targets in North America without going to sea. And they have command and control arrangements right on the port side for these sub, uh, so, uh, with, with these submarines. So in addition to their land-based ICBM force, they have all of their submarines, which are mostly in port most of the time, just like ours, but unlike ours, they are actually a clear and present danger that can be launched in minutes. They're like a, uh, they're ICBMs that are floating on the water, okay? And so almost all of the Russian nuclear force uh, it could be launched at us in a few minutes. And this includes their ballistic missile submarines at, at, at sea. Our submarines at sea might be disabled by an EMP attack because you would call it a system kill. The submarines at, on patrol may survive the EMP attack, but uh, we need, uh, our submarines need unlocking codes and emergency action messages, not only to authorize the use of the nuclear forces, but to unlock them. You know, those codes are not on the boats. They have to come basically from Washington. And if you can paralyze the command and control systems, like the Takamura aircraft and the ground-based very low frequency systems, there's basically two nodes that are, that are necessary, uh, you can render get a system kill against those ballistic missile submarines at sea because they'll basically be useless. You won't be able to launch uh, launch their missiles. This is not true with the Russian submarines. Uh, so concerned are they about surprise attack and being able to launch a surprise attack that the Russians keep their ballistic missile submarines at sea. Unlike us, they don't send them out into the, the most, usually they don't send them out into the Atlantic and Pacific you know, uh, into the deep blue water areas because they're afraid that our attack submarines might be able to get at them. So they keep them in what are called bastion areas, the White Sea and the Sea of Okhotsk, which are heavily patrolled by their Navy uh, to protect their ballistic missile submarines, which have intercontinental missiles on them, don't forget. So they can stay close to Russia's shores and still hit us. And underwater, under these bastion areas, they have run cables, command control communication cables. So the submarine can hook into those cables and just wait for orders, wait for the unlocking codes and be protected by the Navy overhead. So basically all of their ballistic missiles, both on submarines and, both, and, and on land are available for a surprise attack that could be launched in about three and a half minutes. And uh, they don't have to send their submarines to sea, which is what Haynes, uh, uh, DNI Haynes was looking for, submarines going to sea. The submarines at port can be put on alert and ready to launch uh, you know, in uh, three and a half minutes without any visible thing being done. Uh, 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 Haynes, the director of national intelligence is probably listening for uh, DLF communications such as we would use to talk to our submarines. And that would be a sign, oh, they're talking to their submarines. Maybe they're getting ready to do something. But you won't hear that from the Russian side because they have this cable system in their bastion areas specifically to deny us that intelligence. What about the mobile ICBMs, uh, you know, flushing out of their garages 
as a sign of them posturing for, uh, for an attack. Well, you're not going to see that either because the Russian garages for the mobile ICBMs are, have retractable roofs. They can be retracted in, in a couple of minutes and the missiles can launch right from their garages. And if you were planning a surprise attack, you know, you wouldn't send them in large numbers out into the field just for the same reason that you wouldn't flush your boats, precisely because that would be giving warning to your enemy that you're getting ready to make a surprise attack. Unless now the, the Russians uh, uh, have a, they have strategic bombers too, just like us, but unlike us, you know, they have always regarded strategic bombers as an obsolete technology. They, it is a low priority. It's the lowest priority of their, uh, of their leg. Unlike us, where we regard the Air Force has had a longstanding love affair with strategic bombers. And we haven't given up on the strategic bomber, even though it takes three days to generate our strategic bombers and they're not really postured uh, for, for much survivability. Uh, uh, you know, in the Russians case, uh, if you were planning a surprise attack, you probably would not mobilize your strategic bombers precisely because you know BNI Haynes is going to be looking for their mobilization as a sign of an impending nuclear attack. And so it's a way of misleading and, dece and deceiving her. So her testimony to Congress, uh, she either lied about the indicators that you should be looking for on the Russian side that are sensible, because all the indicators that she was describing would apply to our nuclear triad, not the Russian nuclear triad, or, or she's just so incompetent. And I don't, and this could well be the case. You know, they seem to be incompetent in many, many areas that they were much more competent back in the Cold War. It could be they just don't know, you know, because they don't have people working for the intelligence agencies anymore who are deep technical experts in Russian military doctrine, Russian forces, how they operate, how they would be used, you know. Uh, I'm sure there must be some people who are still proficient in those things, as I was when I was working for the CIA, uh, you know, but I also know that those people, just as it was in my day, uh, are probably vastly outnumbered by many other intelligence officers who are working in the strategic forces area who are not deep technical experts on anything Russian or anything Chinese or anything North Korean. You know, our, our intelligence community is top heavy with, uh, with uh, officers from our military services. In other words, we've got Air Force officers who have a lot of experience in how the US Air Force works, you know, working in our intelligence community, and then they are assigned to the Russia desk to help analyze, you know, the threat from Russia. And these guys have, you know, they've spent their whole career with bombers, and uh, uh, they're going to say, well, surely the bombers aren't going to be left out, you know, if the Russians are going to uh, go to nuclear war. And so most of their attention is going to be on the mobilization of bombers. Uh, and we have a lot of people from the submarine service, the ballistic missile, our ballistic missile submarines and how they operate. Surely they're going to put their submarines to sea. I mean, uh, on our, in our uh, 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 triad, the submarine, the ballistic missile submarine is the queen of the battlefield, of the nuclear battlefield. And so how could they, uh, how could they neglect to send their submarines to sea? Uh, you know, so this is the, uh, 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 what about our ICBM people? You know, as I said, there's like, we have 400 ICBM silos, you know, so that's 800 personnel sitting in those silos. Imagine how, what a long, small number of people that is, uh, you know, compared to the number of bomber, bomber pilots we have, compared to the number of people who've been in the Navy and have had submarine service. And this is true in the intelligence community as well. The number of people who have been, have experience working with ICBMs, US ICBMs, is really a small minority. And these people, our, some, our ICBM guys are not indoctrinated in the idea that you can fight and win a nuclear war, and they're not, in, and they're not training for making a surprise nuclear attack against Russia. Uh, and so even the people who are most competent technically to maybe warn about what Russian ICBMs can do are, are, a, are a minority voice. But an even smaller minority voice are those people who have deeply studied Russian military doctrine, Russian history, what their strategic culture is, what their forces are, and how their forces actually operate to prepare for a, for a nuclear war. And, and it's obvious that when DNI Haynes and the other intelligence agencies gave their testimony to Congress to say, oh, Putin's just bluffing, you know, they're just nuclear saber rattling, that these people uh, either uh, basically don't understand the Russian threat at all, 
or they're covering it up and, and lying. And I suspect they're probably lying, you know, because the Biden administration is finding itself increasingly caught in, a, in, a, in, in dilemmas. For example, last week they canceled a Minuteman 3 launch, you know, because they said, well, we don't want to escalate the conflict, co conflict to a nuclear level. Well, if Putin is just bluffing and uh, he's just saber rattling, uh, why, why, put, why, why cancel that Minuteman 3 launch? Uh, for a crisis that supposedly does not exist, all right? Uh, you know, an, 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 another thing, they're, uh, they base their justification on not transferring MiG-29s to Ukraine on the idea of, of, that they don't want to get into a nuclear war with Russia. What? But I thought that there was no risk of us getting into a nuclear war with Russia, right? And so uh, they're getting caught up in, more and more in their own trap as, as, they, uh, as, they, uh, as, as, the, as the war drums beat. For NATO and the United States to jump into the Ukrainian crisis, uh, 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 you know, uh, and 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 the Biden administration pulls back and says, "Well, let's not do that. They're a nuclear armed power. Uh, you know, uh, 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 it's harder and harder for them to justify that position and square that circle with their claim that the Russian nuclear threat, that the Russians are are think the way we do." that they're afraid to use nuclear weapons, they, they won't use nuclear weapons in Ukraine, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and they're not even immediately postured to use nuclear weapons. And this is, a, this is a, a, such a dangerous situation. I think it's one of the most dangerous situations we've ever faced in the nuclear missile age, because I think that this current crisis with Ukraine is as dangerous or more dangerous than the Cuban Missile Crisis was in 1962. At least Kennedy knew and acknowledged the Russian nuclear threat. And he postured our forces for survivability. In the, historically, whenever the Russians have, have made such threats and have credibly made such threats, and uh, we fear that they may be escalating, we have increased the DEFCON level, the defense condition readiness level of our forces to deter them from making a surprise attack. Uh, our highest DEF, we have five levels in our DEFCON level. Uh, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Five is the lowest level. One is the highest level. Uh, Kennedy, and during the Cuban Missile Crisis, went to DEFCON 2, which is just short of nuclear war, okay? And it worked. You know, he got, he got uh, Khrushchev to back off, and he prevailed in the Cuban Missile Crisis. But here, you know, Russia, I think it's, it's clear that they have, that they have uh, by any parameter that you can use, and the clearest parameters are what is happening in Europe, you know, and what is Putin's posture? Okay, what is he saying and, and what has he done? And we know the constant combat readiness posture of his nuclear forces. Uh, so it, we've got a, we, a prudent person would assume, yeah, those forces have gone to a high alert. I would, ass, I would assess that they're, uh, you know, that they're at least at increased combat readiness, if not at threat of war readiness. And for Russia, threat of war readiness is one step away from all out nuclear war. Uh, you know, and I think that's where they are, while the Biden administration, in order to cover its rear and deny that it's blundered its way to uh, the verge of a nuclear war with Russia, has kept our strategic forces at DEFCON 5, at their lowest readiness level. And, uh, and if they're wrong, and I think they are wrong, they're basically posturing us in such a way that we are more vulnerable to a surprise nuclear attack. And that is the situation. People are not aware of it. And all of this, uh, all of this enthusiasm for going to war in Ukraine has got to be considered in the context of this grave nuclear threat that's hanging over our heads. There is no U.S. national security interest that is so profound that it's worth risking a nuclear war with Russia. And I think we're very close to the edge in Russia for that happening. Now, having said that, people will say, well, don't we need to punish Russia, you know, for victimizing Ukraine? Uh, and I say, that's the globalist point of view. The United States is not the global policeman. Uh, you know, uh, if we set a precedent that we have to go to war with Russia or engage in this kind of risky nuclear brinksmanship with Russia and Ukraine, how come we won't, uh, what, what will we do when Russia goes into Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and South Ossetia and Georgia, places that most Americans don't even know, can't find on a map. But all of these nations, just like Ukraine, our, our Partnership for Peace members. They're on this interim step toward becoming NATO member states. And, uh, uh, and the same exact issues will arise, you know, uh, when Putin decides to expand the Russian empire into these areas. Well, 
why can't Russia stay in its own territory and be a good boy and obey the, uh, the and, 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 be, and, and comply with the interests of uh, the United States and NATO? Well, I'm not defending Russia and I'm not defending Vladimir Putin. You know, Russia is an evil empire. Vladimir Putin is an evil guy. But even evil empires and evil people have legitimate security interests. Uh, they have legitimate interests. And I will also acknowledge that they have illegitimate interests too that are not in our, uh, you know, I think part of uh, uh, Putin's reason for wanting to take over Ukraine, it's not entirely defensive at all. He also wants to posture himself so he can pose a greater threat to NATO. But the point is, there's nothing we can do about it. We're too weak to win a conventional war. And uh, we certainly can't win uh, a nuclear war against Russia. They have a 10 to one advantage in tactical nuclear weapons. And we risk pushing this thing over to, an, over to the nuclear threshold so that we'll get in a losing nuclear war with Russia. But what I, but there are muscular, robust, robust, manly things, okay, that chicken hawks like Lindsey Graham, you know, can do and support and should be do, support, supporting to learn a lesson from Ukraine. And if you want to avenge Ukraine and learn a lesson from Ukraine, then remember the lesson of the Cold War. Remember peace through strength, how we won the Cold War. Let's use this crisis to learn that this is what happens. Ukraine is what happens when you allow America to become weak, when we allow ourselves to become weak economically, when we allow ourselves to become weak in terms of energy policy, when we allow ourselves to become weak in terms of the nuclear balance, most of all. You know, a weakness in the nuclear and military balance is a green light to dictatorships to commit aggression. And we're probably going to end facing aggression by China in the, in the Pacific because Russia and China are now allies. And uh, they represent a block of power, uh, both military and economic, uh, that we've never faced before, uh, the greatest threat we've ever faced. So how do we remember the peace through strength? Well, let's protect our electric grids and our other critical infrastructures from EMP and cyber attacks. Let's launch a mass crash program to do that now so that the Russians can't use this new way of warfare to defeat us without even having to go to nuclear weapons. How about space-based missile defenses? That would really make Russia and China, I can't think of anything that would make them, uh, cause them more pain than to cancel the effectiveness of their nuclear missile armies that they've invested so heavily in uh, than by rendering them obsolete with space-based missile defenses. We could have a crash program for space-based missile defenses and deploy brilliant pebbles in five years for $20 billion, which is a tiny fraction of what we've spent in on COVID and uh, uh, you know, on, on, on infrastructure. Uh, we should be modernizing our nuclear deterrent, not looking to the 2030s, our current plans for modernizing the triad of ballistic missile submarine. Most people don't realize our missile submarines, our ICBMs, uh, our bombers, and the warheads they carry are all inherited from Ronald Reagan and before. They're more than 30 years old. We're living off the legacy of, uh, of, the, of the past, while Russia's forces are all modern. Most of our modernization plans that we have now uh, don't envision replacing any of these systems until the 2030s. You know, uh, we've got to greatly accelerate that to catch up with both Russia and China and the modernity of our nuclear delivery systems and in the technology that's in our nuclear warheads. Our, our, our nuclear warheads are also technologically inferior. Some of our nuclear scientists, some of our most prominent, like Dr. John Foster, who was the director of Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and uh, has designed most of the nuclear weapons that are in our current inventory, he's very worried that because they haven't been tested in 30 years, they might not even work. The reliability, well, and we know the Russians and Chinese have been testing at low yield levels, cheating on the comprehensive test ban treaty. So these are the kinds of things, you know, we should be doing on a crash basis. Uh, and, oh, and here's another, another thing. You know, the Biden administration has got this new nuclear posture review that hasn't come out yet. And there's been all kinds of talk about what the left, the anti-nuclear radicals on the left want to do with the nuclear posture review. For example, banning US ICBMs, banning US nuclear strategic bombers, cutting our ballistic missile submarine force in half and reducing our 1500 weapons to just a few hundred weapons. Another thing, reason I suspect that this nuclear crisis with Russia is being covered up is because it, it's an inconvenient truth 
you know, to the to the narrative that the Biden administration wants to have with the nuclear posture of view about, oh, these nuclear threats are overstated. You know, we don't have to worry about nuclear war anymore. Anybody who uses nuclear weapons would be insane. So let's set a good example for the world by even further reducing our nuclear posture. That's what they want to do with the nuclear posture review. And if they were to come out and say, well, you know, our Ukraine policy has gotten us in a nuclear contract with Russia, and we're backing off because of that, it would completely undermine their position on, 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 on denuclearizing the United States. You know, that reminds me of a, of a recent attack wherein uh, Iran just attacked uh, uh, the old U.S. consulate, which apparently belongs to Israel now, and Errol, uh, uh, in Iraq, in the Kurdish region. And they, uh, they pretty much decimated that building. Uh, our new consulate is right next door, apparently. And uh, the U.S. State Department said no damage was done at our consulate, yet for miles around, Buildings were damaged, windows were out, uh, ceilings were falling in at news stations, yet there was absolutely no damage at our consulate. So, you know, I think they're sweeping it under the rug and, and because they want so much to, to negotiate a treaty uh, with Iran, to, uh, you know, under the old uh, JCPOA agreement, uh, which uh, has already been violated by Iran. But the, the, the administration is so desperate to uh, negotiate this treaty that they are willing to ignore getting hit in the eye. You know, it's like the, the, the little kid on the playground, the bully's punching them and they're, and, and they're acting like, oh, you're being so nice to me. You know, I don't know what's going on here. It's just they're, they're, they seem to have lost their bearing in all things international, in my humble opinion. I agree. I think, I think uh, the reason they're negotiating such a, a bad Iran deal is because the administration basically thinks that nuclear weapons have no utility, that they're just symbolic, that they can't, that only a madman would ever use them. And so it doesn't matter uh, uh, if, uh, if they get a bad deal from Iran uh, uh, in the end of the day, because Iran will never use the nuclear weapons if it, if it does develop them. And they, so, they are so determined, they, they hate Donald Trump more and, uh, and the Republicans more uh, then they fear Iranian nuclear weapons. And so just to make Trump look bad, you know, they want to come back and have a bad deal with Iran, even though it'll probably be another way, uh, it'll probably uh, enable Iran to become a nuclear weapon state uh, even faster. Although, you know, my view from past conversations is that Iran has probably been a nuclear weapon state for quite some time. Another bit of the anti-nuclear bias, the attempt, attempt to keep people's attention off of the nuclear threat uh, that causes cognitive dissonance and is a part of a narrative that they don't want people to hear, is that the Defense Department has come out and admitted uh, that uh, over the past two weeks, uh, uh, North Korea has tested components of its new ICBM. They uh, displayed uh, back in December 2020 uh, the world's largest mobile ICBM, uh, you know, which has, uh, I think it's called the HK-16, uh, which is even more powerful, uh, potentially, than the, nucle than the ICBMs they demonstrated back in 2017 that can strike any city in the United States, that can deliver hydrogen bombs against any city in the United States. Now they've got a new one. Some people have speculated because of the size of this new ICBM, that it might end, end up carrying multiple independently targeted reentry vehicles, because North Korea has been progressing by leaps and bounds technologically and surprising us every time. And that's because they're getting help from the Russians and Chinese in terms of the technology. Uh, the, uh, apparently what they did is they launched stages of this uh, new ICBM to test the components. And uh, so it's likely that they're probably gonna do a full on test maybe this year of this, uh, of, of this new ICBM. Uh, and I found it interesting that uh, uh, in the past when, when, uh, when North Korea did uh, ICBM tests or testing ICBM components, the Department of Defense was quick to come out with that information. But they obviously have been either trying to cover it up and smart reporters basically didn't let them get away with it. I mean, there are other people now. Uh, I shouldn't say smart reporters. I don't believe in such a thing. That's an oxymoron. But there are other analysts, not all the good analysts work in the Department of Defense or the intelligence community. There are independent analysts, uh, you know, who can look at the data and say, wait a minute, this thing is not a scud. This is an ICBM stage being tested. 
And so uh, the DOD reluctantly, I think, finally came out and admit, uh, admitted, well, you know, the North Koreans are actually testing this gigantic ICBM that they de demonstrated to us or did, that they displayed back in December 2020. This is another inconvenient truth that doesn't fit into the anti-nuclear narrative of the Biden administration. Uh, I, I see that North Korea testing an ICBM. I, w w w the first test was February 26, just before Putin uh, announced his nuclear alert. Uh, but uh, this is uh, a major act of aggression, you know, by the by the North Koreans. We've been expecting uh, acts of aggression from clients of Russia and China and aggression from China itself. And I think this is, this is, this is an act of, uh, a, a major act of aggression. Uh, 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 you know, one of the things people were worried about is, well, maybe North Korea would invade South Korea. I think that this is an even worse act of aggression in terms of US national interests because they're testing a system that can, that can put the United States under the nuclear gun from North Korea, which is supposed to be totally unacceptable. Every American president, you know, since Bill Clinton has promised that North Korea will never be allowed to become a nuclear weapons state. But that is obviously uh, becoming a lie in major spades. And that too undermines the narrative that they want, you know, undermines the, the, the objective of denuclearizing the United States and greatly reducing our nuclear deterrent. Uh, it would make, uh, to most Americans, fortunately, most Americans have common sense and would say just uh, doesn't make any sense that, that we're getting these nuclear threats from Russia. China is greatly expanding its nuclear arsenal with all these ICBM silos it's building in the desert. Iran is, uh, uh, even if I believe the optimists, is only eight weeks away from the atomic bomb. And now North, North Korea is testing an even bigger ICBM than it had. And you guys want to, <laughs> you guys want to reduce the United States nuclear arsenal by getting rid of our ICBMs and our bombers and and reducing us to a few hundred weapons, to go from 1,500 weapons to a few hundred weapons. So we would basically have a nuclear deterrent about the size of France or England. Uh, you know, that uh, that's, uh, seems a guaranteed way of, uh, of inviting a nuclear war instead of preventing one. Yeah, so one, one thing that you talked about was the transfer of technology to North Korea. One thing that a lot of people aren't aware of is Dr. William Graham uh, testified to Congress in 2008 that in fact, the Russians not only had EMP super weapons that could put out 200,000 volts per meter, which was four times greater than our hardening standard for our hardened military facilities, but they had transferred this technology to North Korea. And so we know, and, and that's what they told us when the wall fell and we thought we were all gonna be good friends with, with Russia and they were thinking we were gonna be good friends with them. Uh, before tensions ratcheted back up, thanks to the globalists who uh, wanted to eat Russia, basically like a, a cooked Christmas turkey. Uh, and so what's happened since then is that they have reinvigorated North Korea. And North Korea, you know, they, where would they get the wherewithal to do all these kind of developments on their own? It's obvious that they uh, have been supported by Russia and China in these developments. And this is dangerous. Because Let me make one final point here. Well, one thing that uh, Dr. Pry mentioned was this uh, our, uh, emergency action uh, message that has to go out to our nuclear forces to uh, alert them to launch. I have a lot of people, and I have to, uh, to remind them of this, they think our submarines at sea, uh, which are not at sea, uh, but they think our submarines are going to be able to counterattack if we get a hit, and that's why nobody will hit us. Well, they can't do it when they have these EMP attacks taken out of our communication systems. They're just going to be uh, bobbling floats out there in the water uh, for in terms of strategic deterrence, they will have no effect. Yes, that's right. And if you want confirmation of that, watch the movie Crimson Tide. Crimson Tide. Uh, you know, it's a, a, a movie about a ballistic, U.S. ballistic missile submarine out at sea. I think Gene Hackman is the captain. And uh, I think Denzel Washington is his, his second in command. And there's a big dispute. They get a partial emergency action message. And there's a dispute about whether they should launch the missiles on the boat or not. And uh, Crimson Tide is all about that. And the premise is, is that they can launch even on this per partial emergency action message. But then there's a blurb at the end of the movie that says, actually, they can't. They, uh, uh, and, this actual, and this was done during the Clinton administration. There was a time when we could launch the missiles from the submarines at sea 
even if the National Command Authority was decapitated. That was the whole reason for having them at sea. But the Clinton administration, in its wisdom, decided to change that policy. So now the, 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 the submarines uh, have to get emergency action messages and unlocking codes. Otherwise, they can't, they can't launch at all. But it's, I, I believe it's, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's right there in the movie uh, that there's a little blurb at the end of the movie that, uh, that talks about this, how, how we repostured the boat. So you don't have to worry about this scenario in Crimson Tide ever it happening. Is it is there at the end of that movie. And that's what to be worried about. So they use this scenario to scare people. And, and this is why we come up with these systems that have made us impotent in being able to respond to an attack, unfortunately. The only good thing about that maybe, or maybe the best thing about that maybe was the name on the boat. <laughs> what was the name on the boat? I don't remember. It was the USS Alabama. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Right, right, yes. But that's, that's how our policy, that's what happens when you have these arms control idiots from Harvard and Yale, people who have never been in a war, never worn a uniform, they don't have any understanding of military history, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and they, they basically are the ones uh, that drive our US nuclear posture and our nuclear planning uh, so that they'll do something like, well, let's take away the unlocking codes and require the submarines to have emergency action messages when, uh, when they're on patrol at sea. It defeats the whole point of having the boats out there on patrol. You know, it greatly diminishes their value as a deterrent. But, and it's even been advertised to the Russians. It's right on a movie that we did that, right? It didn't even try to keep it secret. I guess they would justify that as another step in terms of our transparency and crisis stability. So the Russians don't even have to worry about the nuclear submarines at sea if they can EMP our command and control assets and cut them off. But in all these ways, we're just setting ourselves up, uh, you know, for uh, uh, a, a, a nuclear war, a nuclear catastrophe, a, a nuclear Pearl Harbor, or a nuclear 9-11, as, uh, uh, as I've described it. That's why there's a nuclear 9-11 in our future, given the, the way these current trends are going. And it looks like I've, I've uh, overstayed my welcome here. Um, I tell you what we should do real fast uh, is we should uh, give people some pointers, some places to go, and things they can do because we're still alive and breathing, and so we still have hope in, in, in our lungs that we might can do something. So I'm going to show you guys uh, Dr. Pry's website here first and foremost. Hang on, let me get move this around. This is the uh, this is the uh, website. Uh, the EMP uh, task force called National and Homeland Security. And you just go to emptaskforce.us right here. I will put a link in this video. And he's got a lot of good resources in here, a lot of links you can click on, including his uh, Blackout Warfare uh, books and so forth. I've got one of his books right here, of course, The Blackout Wars uh, from Dr. Pry. Uh, Dr. Pry has been very supportive in uh, efforts to get our grid hardened. He's been to both of my power grid defense conferences and even joined me in Montgomery and talking to our Alabama state officials to, to wake them up as to the gravity of this situation. So uh, Dr. Pry is a, a clear national leader. He sticks his neck out for this stuff and uh, spends a lot of his own time and money to make these things happen. You can support him here. I think there's a click in place on here somewhere where you can uh, help give him a little bit money to help out with some of that effort that he puts into this. And another thing you could do is what we've done in this video is we have shown you the weaknesses in our current posture. Uh, do you think we should go to DEF CON 2 now? Yes, I think so. And we should notify the Russians that we're doing that because they announced that they're escalating, you know, their readiness level, that That's we are not going to let ourselves be taken by surprise. That's and when we do that, ask them, you know, and say, Please announce that you're bringing your forces down. Do something visible that we can see that you're de-escalating your side, and we'll do it the same on ours. You know, and that's that's how because and that's how the Biden administration doesn't want to do it because they're afraid that if we start mobilizing, that the Russians will strike us, and they're right to be concerned about that, especially since they let the Russians get a head start. But I think we can do it. It's that it's safer for us to be prepared than not prepared. And you can do it in a stable way by letting them know we're raising the readiness of our forces because we're not going to let you guys 
He was surprised to attack on us. Bingo, that should be the message. So I've got this, the freedomrestorationfoundation.org. If you click on Action Center, this tells you, if you go underneath the alerts here, you can see how to make your voices count, how to track bills in the government, uh, state and uh, uh, federal. And you can see how to contact your, your state representatives. And this is who you need to talk to. You need to talk to your congressman, find out who your representative is, who your two senators are. This tells you how to send email, how to call, write, what to write, what to say on the telephone. And it gives you all the resources for how to contact your Congress critters, your representatives. Uh, you can use this page as your resource page to give you a guide of how to contact Congress. And what you need to do is call your representative in the House of Representatives, call your two senators and tell them this. Uh, hey, we know that our uh, nuclear posture has left us behind. We are at risk of a 9-11 of a surprise attack from Russia, maybe China or even North Korea. And we need to... Uh, we need to bulk up our forces so this don't happen. And right now, while we're uh, under this the threat of Russia, we ought to go to a DEFCON 2 level. And in fact, we ought to uh, communicate this to Russia and tell them, hey, we're not planning to hit you, but we're doing this because we are concerned that you might hit us. And with all our, uh, our, our, our systems in port, we know we're vulnerable. We know you know that. We don't want you to be able to take us out with a surprise attack. And since you had communicated to us that you were on a height and alert, we're going to respond in the same. You started this. We're just responding. We're not planning to launch first, but we're going to be ready. And that is the message that we need to send our congressmen. And we need to talk to these uh, senators who are out there talking nonsense, like uh, uh, Jim Reich and uh, Lindsey Graham. There's some congressmen also talking this nonsense that, hey, we need to step down. We need to pull away from Ukraine and we don't need to put up a new uh, 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 no-fly zone and all these kind of knucklehead things that we don't right. plan to challenge Russia in Ukraine, but we don't want Russia uh, taking us. So uh, that's what the message ought to be. We need to defend our own country. We need to take all this energy that's put in, being put into defending Ukraine's borders and put it into defending our borders and our country. Wow, we defend our borders. Our electric grids by 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 putting up space-based missile defenses. You know all the things Ronald Reagan planned to do and did do. You know we've got to start that again, modernizing our own nuclear triad so that Russia and China don't have a huge advantage over us. You know national security starts at home. You know, uh, this, uh, this business about getting into a war with Russia over Ukraine is, uh, is potentially suicidal for us. You know, it's a war we won't be able to win. And why should we even get in a war with them for it? We have no interest in, in Ukraine any more than we do in Kazakhstan and Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, because that's where we're going. We're going to go with, uh, have to practice nuclear brinksmanship over and over and over again. And it's like playing Russian nuclear roulette. You know, even if we get out of Ukraine, the next crisis, well, at some point, the nuclear trigger is going to drop. Yeah, the problem is, is it's just that it's Russian roulette. We, we are playing with a revolver and we keep spinning the chamber on it. And we don't even know how many rounds are in that chamber, uh, re, uh, revolver. We don't even know how many chambers it has, but it's definitely got chambers and many of them have rounds in them. But every time we do this, we're spinning that. And to act like that it, it's inconsequential is ignorant. It is ignorant. So I have to say, uh, Senator Lindsey Graham and Senator uh, Rice, you're both ignorant. And I don't care if you hear me saying that because you've shown it. Uh, and, and several of these people, uh, 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 Peter, have actually come out and said that uh, we realize it's a heightened risk of war. And a few of them have even said nuclear war with Russia. There's been some generals that admitted that, but they think the risk is worth it. Really? You really want to put the whole country, the whole world, including little pygmy tribes in Africa, at risk of, of dying as a result of a nuclear war and a fallout and a potential nuclear winter, because you think that there's a that you can manage the risk of something that can escalate out of hand. You need to think back to World War One, that gen, that single bullet that took the Arctic Ferdinand and out that uh, launched the World War One. Which really, the World War II was an offshoot of World War One. My granddad was in, in the trenches in France during World War One and over the battlefields in, in, in the Germany. My dad followed him through the same battlefields uh, so, and then following the war in World War II. So uh, fortunately, they both survived. But World War Three, 
uh, all bets are off. We, we, uh, that will be uh, on our heads right here at home. And the prospects of, even if we don't get nuked, even if they just EMP us, according to the task force that Dr. Price supported, uh, the optimistic uh, estimate, which I call optimistic, and I'll explain this to Dr. Prime why I think it's optimistic, but uh, nine out of 10 people in America would perish in a year due to societal collapse after an EMP. Uh, so this is not trivial, guys. This is not trivial. It's not funny. And these guys are taking way too many risks to serve interests that are not American risks. They're not our risks. They're not our interests. They're serving the globalists. Exactly, exactly. And I, I've got to run, but a parting, uh, a parting note I would say on this, for everybody who believes in the Constitution, okay, which is what America is all about, it's so especially dismaying to hear Republican members of Congress and Republican members of the Senate crying for us to jump into the Ukraine war when they haven't even declared war. They haven't executed their constitutional duty to have a public discussion about whether we should be getting involved in Ukraine. And putting this country at risk, you know, and they're the ones that are supposed to do that, uh, at, you know, in the Senate and the House, have that conversation, have an open debate about how are America's interests served or put at risk by the Ukrainian affair, and then declare war, convince America that we should be declaring war, you know, instead, they want to treat Biden like he's a Roman emperor, and, 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 and go along with what this, uh, uh, I I'm reluctant to call them to, uh, uh, Bill Clinton was more like uh, Caligula. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think there was a Roman emperor, Elagabulus, uh, who put, you know, that is, that is the best pa parallel for Biden, who, uh, you know, basically was uh, uh, pushed a black rock around the streets of Rome. And I mean, it was just, uh, well, anyway, that, uh, that up the point. The point, point is that if you're a real American who believes in the constitution, you know, uh, uh, a cautious approach is always necessary before you get in, involved in another war. And we need to ha go through the constitutional process of at least having a debate in it or, or over it. Uh, you know, I personally think, and I've expressed my views at great length here as to why I think we shouldn't be involved in a war for Ukraine, because it doesn't serve our interests. It puts our country at risk of nuclear destruction and uh, and there are, and uh, and our energy should be placed at de defending our borders, defending this country through peace, through strength, by beefing up our nuclear capabilities, protecting our electric grids, and de deploying space-based missile defenses to protect ourselves from the growing nuclear threat from Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. But thank you for hearing me out and having me here today. Well, thank you, Dr. Pry. On my channel, we very much believe in the Constitution. I talk about it a lot. And that's why I started that Freedom Restoration Foundation. And uh, Dr. Pry, we, we really appreciate you coming on this channel and sharing your knowledge, your in-depth knowledge of these weapon systems. Uh, the notion that uh, the missiles are, that are on our submarines are only intermittent inter range missiles uh, will be an eye opener to a lot of people. The nature of the e uh, EAMs will be an eye opener. So I'd like for you guys to share, you watchers to share this video in your emails with your congressman and say, well, how about answering this? How about speaking to this? Bring it up uh, and share this with your friends and family and tell them, that, hey, you need to get involved and y'all need to, we all need to work to uh, contact our congressmen. Share this video around and do this. Try to make the contact, spread it. This needs to go viral because we're trying to save our nation. We're trying to save the world, people. This is a real risk. And, 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 and putting ourselves on a, a better foot and a better posture is not going to put us at risk. It may be the one thing that's going to save us. So we need to do something. We need to do something fast. Things are getting out of hand. Maybe we'll be lucky and they'll put a peace treaty in between the U.S. and Ukraine, but we still fundamentally have these flaws in our structures, and it's going to challenge us with China. It's going to challenge us with North Korea and maybe Iran down the road. So this is why we need to act and need to act now while we can. So, Dr. Pry, thank you very much, sir. Thank you for having me. My heroes are people like you. So, uh, right back at you. <laughs> it's not men in tights, it's men with, with, who've got some brights. <laughs> thank you, sir. I pre greatly appreciate it. A great you. America. Thank you, sir. And have an awesome day. Thank you for being on the channel. And everyone, please, please, please heed this message, share this video, and uh, take action. Thank you for watching. Greg out.